is part of our Safe Routes to School program and is funded by Caltrans. And we also appreciate the support today from Shasta Living Streets, who will be, um, Anne Thomas will be coming up here later to speak, and the California Convergence. They're the ones taking your photos probably in the lobby. Um, so now I just want to call on Amy Pendergast to say a few words. Hello, I'm Amy from Healthy Shasta, and I'm really excited to see all of you here. And we have a lot of great speakers coming up. A few housekeeping items. There will be food during the breaks in the lobby. At 5 o'clock, there's the table topics, and you can pick the topic you want to talk about and mingle at that table and talk with others. And um, there's restrooms and things in the lobby as well. And I'm just going to go ahead and turn this over to Francy Sullivan to welcome everyone here. She is the current mayor for the city of Reading and has always been very supportive of bicycling and active community environments. Thank you. Thank you all for coming, and you'll all be relieved to know that you have a timekeeper down here instead of um, Our theme today is making connections, and it's all about collaboration. And I want to start by saying thank you to Safe, Rate, Safe Routes to School. When it's safe for kids to get to school, it's a lot safer for the rest of us. Healthy Shasta, Shasta Living Streets, and Caltrans. And that first connection I'd like to be between your right hand and your left hand and join me in thanking them. Um, so obviously, again, our, our effort today is to talk about collaboration to create great communities. Some of the other things that will happen, you all know, but later on at 5, there will be table topics. Uh, pick Pick your uh, topic of greatest concern, and have a little snack, and chat with other people. Um, tonight, you are all invited as free guests. Is that true? Did I read that right? As free guests. Actually, as guests of the members of Shasta Living Streets. That's really why I wore my t-shirt. I always forget it says Robin, but I really love Robin, too. Um, but uh, tonight, we are having a members party for Shasta Living Streets at Old City Hall from 6.30 to 9.30. And anyone who is here today is invited to come as a, as a guest. So it'll be a great party. More food, more music, and a great way to end the evening talking to some more other people who uh, like to walk and ride bikes. Um, and tomorrow, I think there, I saw this a while ago up here, but speaking of the trail, there's going to be tours of the trail uh, with Terry Hansen, who is, you know, but where is this Terry here? He usually frowns if you say nice things about him when he's around where he can see you. But Terry deserves a lot of credit for the rest, for giving, providing bike trails for the rest of us. There's going to be a walking tour with Terry, uh, bike tours, a pop up flavorhood, I love that word, and a Sundial Bridge tour. So we hope all of you can, uh, can stay for that. Uh, we ordered this weather uh, especially for this weekend. And um, I think it says much about the attitude out in the cosmos for people who want to walk and ride bikes, that we got a day like this to talk about it. Um, so with that, I'm moving on to the real uh, treat this morning, Brian Jones, who is a professional engineer and planner at Alt Planning Plus Design um, in Oakland and headquartered in Portland, two cities that I like to walk in. And and am envious of their, um, of their livability. Um, he has expertise in creating walkable and bicycle-friendly communities, uh, background in public works, engineering in Fresno, Carlsbad, and others. I didn't say that with the right inflection. And he's a voting member of the California Traffic Control Devices, which I think, um, I'm, I'm anxious to hear more about that, because they are the people who have saved my life a few times when I was trying to get across many lanes of traffic. But uh, I was actually pumping him for um, what he does in other communities before the talk. But I think that's what his talk is going to be about. And he says it much better than I do. But again, thank you all for coming. I hope you'll share all this wonderful information with all the unfortunate people that couldn't spend the afternoon with us. And with that, Mr. Jones. Okay, 
I am honored to be up here in Reading. It was a beautiful drive up here yesterday, and I just kept looking at Mount Shasta and kept heading north on I-5, and I knew I was heading in the right direction. So, um, and last night and today I got to drive around your beautiful city and see all the great progress that's going on in Reading, and I want to commend uh, the city of Reading and Caltrans for a lot of great projects they're doing, whether it's road diets, these pedestrian crossings right out in front of this school, a number of different solutions, and I think there's a lot of great things that are going on, and, and it's a lot of great things to build momentum off of uh, for the future as we try to build a more connected Reading and a Shasta County. So uh, with that, um, my talk today is about creating great communities through transportation. And, and historically, we've been doing transportation through communities. And, and if we flip it around, we can create better communities. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about how to do that and, and some examples of, of that and why we should be doing that. And so to start off, I always like to start off with a little story because it's like a bedtime story, but I'm not trying to put you to sleep. Oh, and wait before. I have a basket. You guys want to pass this around, and if you put your business card in, I have a, a book, and I have a book, and some gift certificates, and some trinkets, and everything else to give away, so you can go home feeling like a winner. So um, feel free to put your business card or put something in there um, that has your name on it, and you need not be present to win because I can mail it to you. But um, hopefully, you are present, so we can all cheer and be excited for you. But once upon a time, we thought the world was flat, and it limited our mobility and we didn't leave the shores too far, and we didn't, we didn't interact by ship very much. And then we realized the world was round, and we opened up trade centers, we found new lands, and we explored the world. Much like that, our water industry went from going from quantity of water to quality of water. And so you'll find that we do a lot of stormwater retention basins to clean the water before it goes back into the Sacramento River or the San Francisco Bay um, or to the ocean. But our transportation has been really still doing transportation through communities rather than communities through transportation. And as a result, we've been getting a lot of solutions that look like this. And, and I'm not sure how many lanes are up there because I lost count once I got past my fingers and toes. Uh, but there's a lot of lanes up there, and this is down in San Diego. It's the 805 freeway and the 5 freeway. I-5 goes all the way down to San Diego. And um, so if you just get on I-5 and keep heading south, you'll eventually get there. Maybe 9 or 10 hours later. But at any rate, you'll get down to a roadway that looks like this. And it's so big and so wide and so vast and so noisy and so pollution. And it's not a pleasant experience to live by, travel on. And this is taken at about 10.30 in the morning, but between 6.30 and 9.30, it, it, it looks like a parking lot. So um, we design it for a parking lot, and then on off-peak hours, everybody's going at 110 miles an hour. Um, so if we change, we saw what water looks like when we went water to equality. What did transportation look like? And I just want you to get a visual image in your head of what could transportation look like in, what is the most favorite street you've ever been on and experienced? And I'm guessing it might not be Cypress. Um, I'm guessing it might not have been I-5. But, I mean, I-5 does have a great view when you're heading north, so. Uh, um, but, what street and where do you go to experience a great street and great transportation? I'm pretty sure going to the mall is not the best experience as a pedestrian or a bicyclist. And it's really not that great of an experience for a motorist because you're going to parking in a parking lot amongst a bunch of other cars and then you have to walk four or 500 feet to the front door. Um, and we've built a lot of those around our communities. And, and we, we sized them for Black Friday. Uh, um, and then we have, the rest of the days, we just have black asphalt. <laughs> uh, um, but really understanding the situation is we have a lot of cars. And we have a few people in those cars. And how do we connect those people when they're not connected in their cars? And since I'm hired by the health department, I always have a slide in here, but I like this. Now, this is in most of my slides. Because at one time, I kind of looked more like that right. Um, and I'm trying to look more like the middle. Uh, um, but why are people going and becoming
coming to look more like the right. And I'm going to show you what their exercise looks like. It looks like this. <laughs> They're not burning a lot of calories sitting on their rear end in the car, moving their ankle. Somebody said, well, they get a little core workout moving the steering wheel like this. Uh -uh. But we as a society are going more and more to the right because we're designing our transportation system to facilitate this as exercise rather than walking and biking as exercise, as our daily activities. And so what I'd like to say is we've been protecting the fish, we've been protecting the plants, we've been protecting the animals, but maybe we need to start protecting ourselves. Maybe we need to start looking at as pedestrians and bicyclists as the indicator species. And I say the transportation food chain, we often design our communities around that orange vehicle that's called Ally. And as I've moved around in jobs in the state, that thing moves my wife's shoes. We have another one for her clothes and another one for our furniture. <laughs> and my stuff fits in the trunk of the car. Um, but at the bottom of the food chain, we're designing our streets for the orange truck, but we're losing the bottom of the food chain. Fewer and fewer kids are walking and biking to school. Their parents don't feel safe for them being on the streets. And as a result, we get a lot of congestion around our schools. And then that perpetuates more people driving because they don't want their kids run over. But as soon as they drop their kid off, they're part of the problem running over the next kid. And you'll watch it at any elementary, middle school, or high school in America. And the real issue is when we have roadways that are 40 miles an hour, you have a huge chance of dying or a severe injury. But if we slow traffic down, which is already a parking lot in the peak hour anyways, to 20 miles per hour or 30 miles per hour, you have a greater chance of surviving a collision. And here is that image. And this image is also for economic vitality. As a motorist driving down a street at 15 miles an hour, they can see the storefronts, the pedestrians, the bicyclists. They can become customers and decide where they want to be. At 30 miles an hour, this is what they see. At 50 miles an hour, it's a pinpoint drop, and they don't see anything. They almost don't see the car in front of them. And as a result, when pedestrians and bicyclists are on that street, or businesses, they have no idea what is on that street. So I have a lot of real estate agents that call me and say, how many traffic are on the, how much traffic is on this roadway? And I'm like, it really does, I'm gonna tell you a little secret. It doesn't matter how much traffic is on the roadway, it's how fast the traffic is moving on that roadway. If it's moving more than 20 miles an hour, they're not seeing your storefront, so it doesn't matter. And if they're moving more than 20 miles an hour, they're creating an environment where your customers don't wanna do window shopping in your businesses. And I say, a well-trained motorist stops at a red light, just like a cat does at the or the dogs do at the canine academy. Right? This is how you pass as a canine uh, officer. You got to let that cat walk in front of you without attacking it. But we often ask for that pedestrian to cross 140 feet, eight-lane roadways, to get to the other side of the roadway, and we do that because we have this policy about level of service in our general plans. And we say, we put in some assumptions into the computer, and the computer tells us that your roadway needs to be 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 10, 12, oops, and it now needs to be 13. And we try to build our way out of congestion. Let me tell you, the 26 lanes down in San Diego still results in congestion. They can make that 48 lanes, and it still results in congestion you won't be able to build yourself out of congestion. So what I'm encouraging you to do is to consider first starting with designing your roadways for people and then accommodating the automobile. And when you first design for people in place, you create a much different environment for users. And when you look at it from an economic prosperity per perspective, here's the same roadway two different times of the day, off-peak and on-peak. One to an economist is level of service after getting very little bang for your buck. And the other is, a, to an economist's level of service, hey, you're getting a lot of bang for your buck. You're moving up a lot. You're, that roadway is being well used. But here's another crux. The bigger the wider the roadways, 
the more infrastructure and maintenance costs that we spend on it, the, th the more s speed is on the roadway. And as a result, they become less safe. And when we go back to the level of service computer model, the one on the left was built before the computer was created, and the one on the right is, is basically what the computer is telling you to do. They move the same 9,000 cars on them. They were just built in a different era of transportation. One is five lanes and moves at 55 miles per hour. The other one is two lanes and moves at 30 to 35 miles an hour. One has a school. One has five lanes we need to maintain. We're moving them twice as fast, but they have to come to a red light just like the other one, and they don't, but really they're, how fast they go along the corridor is very indifferent because the traffic signal is the greater influence. So one thing I always like to say at the bottom is, uh, wide roadways often disconnect people and communities from their potential. Every year we're killing 32,000 people on our roadways in America. It's a tra phenomenal, traumatic number and it's staggering. And incomplete safe streets exist and this is why people are dying. Here is a public works department and a transit agency that aren't working together because one built a sidewalk for a private development and the bus stop is still 200 feet from the end of the sidewalk. This is near a senior citizen community. Those seniors have to get out into that 50 mile, 55 mile an hour bike lane adjacent to traffic and walk 150 to 200 feet to get to that bus stop. This is their only mode of transportation because they gave up their driver's license. This bus picks up immigrant farm workers. They have to slide down that hill to get to the bus. This sidewalk has a guardrail protecting the cars from going off the cliff, but the pedestrians can't walk on the sidewalk. So let's say that lady in front of that single wide stroller, and many of us now have double wide strollers, wants to turn around and head the opposite direction. She can't pass that guy without really getting intimate with him. Maybe that's a benefit. But as a result, she has to go on the other side of that guardrail that's protecting the cars that can't stay in their travel lane. Here's a sidewalk where a bridge was made, built, and the sidewalk didn't go across the bridge. The right turn lane was more important than the sidewalk. This is also on the other side of that sidewalk that didn't quite make it to the bus stop. So the seniors are walking on this sidewalk, they have to get into this right turn lane, they cross a 100 foot intersection to get to another sidewalk, and then they have to go 150 to 200 feet in the bike lane to get to that bus stop. Pretty traumatic experience when somebody's in a walker. So a really smart guy, an innovative guy named Elon Musk, who's doing SpaceX and, and Teslas, and if you're invested in his company, you're probably pretty wealthy right now. Um, he says we need a feedback loop we need to continually ask, are we, are, is what we're doing the best thing? And is there any way we can do it better? He reinvented the car, he re reinvented the space shuttle. He's saving the US federal government millions of dollars on every launch. And what I say is we need a new vision. If you build cities for cars and traffic, you get more cars and traffic. If you plan for people and places, you get people and places. So, how do we better move and connect people safe, safely and efficiently, or effectively, so that communities can thrive? And that's really about building connections. Here's a street where we added some nice lights up in the trees to create the ambiance and bring music out onto the street. And all of a sudden, the community is gathering around this music. This is what streets can do. We changed how streets were called. Instead of calling them collectors, collecting cars, we started calling them connectors, connecting people. When you design streets to connect people, it's a very different street than if you design streets to collect cars. Here's a pleasant sidewalk where outdoor patios and dining is going to occur. Here's a family using bike lanes, buffered bike lanes. Here's a farmer's market on the street. We brought this farmer's market on the street so that people could experience the businesses that were on that street. It shuts down from Wednesday from 1 to 5 p.m. and everybody can buy great produce. And they also see all the businesses that are on the street that they drive by way too fast. 
So livable streets is really expanding how we're looking at streets and connecting the destinations of where people are starting and where they want to be with where they're in in between. It's looking at how do we make the connections in our community. And when we do a word chart, we bring a whole bunch of people together to define livability. The biggest word comes out is connectivity. The other one is pedestrians. That's also equivalent to people. Bicyclists, that's equivalent to people. And you really don't see the big word of automobiles up there. I don't think. But when we talk about connectivity, how many of your subdivisions are connected to each other? Or do you have walls around them? Are they cul-de-sacs? Are they dead ends? Is the only way in and out of your subdivision through a four or six lane roadway? Or can you get to the school in the market through a nice grid system that like exists in this neighborhood? And when you look at economic vitality, transportation is a great indicator. So how do we provide for demand? We have to start managing it better. We have to stop providing for, for demand and, and start managing and providing choices. Choices in routes, choices in mobility, choices in destinations. We have to bring a bunch of different disciplines together. It's not just planners and engineers, it's public health, it's schools, it's advocates, it's smart growth, it's urban equity, it's economists, it's historians. And I'm going to let you in on a little secret. This book came out in January of 2014. It's a bestseller. Every community public works director, community development director, university, and mayor and council member should have this book. The secret to great cities and towns is your street design. It's a step-by-step -step way to how to create great streets in your community. Victor Dover and John Masegale are incredible architects and both very good friends. So I give them a little plug, but it's an incredible book. I read it in one weekend. It's $84 or something like that. Um, but what else can we be asking for our street to do for us? Because a lot of times we're just giving it more pavement and providing more capacity. But what other thresholds could we be looking at for our streets? And we have a number of other measurements that we could be looking at our streets. And really, that comes down to being the difference between of being efficient and being effective. And are we doing the right things? Not just doing things right. Because for a long time we've been trying to be really efficient and do the right do things right. And now is a good time to take a step back and identify what can we be focusing on to do things to do the right things. Because when we have different goals, we get different outcomes. When we talk about performance measurements, we talk about connectivity, prosperity. You know, a lot of businesses like Amazon up in Seattle told the city of Seattle, we will move in as long as you put a cycle track, which is a separated bikeway next to our facility. You have big technology companies down in the Bay Area and Los Angeles that are investing heavily in their communities, trying to get their communities to be connected to, to BART stations and Caltrain stations and shuttle systems and whatnot so that their employees have an option to get to their campuses because they can't afford to build parking garages and it's more costly to get their employees to change their behavior, it's also better because their health insurance premiums go down. Because when your employee is walking or biking, they have a decrease in health premiums. But it's really about doing things different. We often do things in silos and really it's about what can we all do as a community? How do we bring transportation, land use, economic development, parks and schools and advocates and community citizens and leaders together? And we often, you know, most people are looking for the same thing, but what we often design for is speed. We first said, um, how fast do we want this street to go? We say, oh, we want to design speed of 65 or 75 miles an hour, so we built a street that allows them to go 65 or 75 miles an hour. Oh wait, we allow the semi-truck to go 65 or 70 miles an hour, but your performance vehicle can go 85 or 95 miles an hour. And then you get a speeding citation for $5,500. We kind of induce you into speeding. So creating opportunities from perceived challenges. How, how do we do that? In Carlsbad, we had the Carlsbad Residential Traffic Management Program. And we designed, to, uh, we first designed about 
enforcement and education. We did enforcement out there, we did an education, and then we went to a, the, their next solution was a $300,000 solution for each residential street. And my mayor and council said, wait, 300,000 times the 30 streets on the list, that's a $9 million program. We don't like that. Is there something we could do that's more cost effective? So we inserted phase two into it, which was traffic management, and we use stop signs in residential neighborhoods to calm traffic. Now, I sit on the MUTCD and it says, you should not use stop signs for traffic control. It does not say you shall not. And for $1,500 an intersection, and I can kick out four or five intersections on a residential corridor for under $10,000 and improve the safety and quality of life in a residential neighborhood, that's a pretty good success story. Now I can do all 300 streets for, or all 30 streets for $300,000 rather than 30 streets for $9 million. Huge game changer for that community. Here's a crosswalk that I worked on in Fremont. Four lane roadway. Here's all the pedestrian collisions that happened at that crosswalk. They were doing involuntary cartwheels over a 40 mile an hour car, putting a star on the windshield with their forehead. Pretty traumatic, and it was all caught on videotape. They forced me to watch the videotape. It was a pretty traumatic experience. It also necessitated me taking a different approach and a different look to getting something out there rather than an eight to 18 month program to find a solution. We did something in about six weeks. We knew from our theory that creating pole bounce to reduce the crossing width helped improve the safety and vulnerability of pedestrians crossing. We also knew to increase the visibility of voters seeing those pedestrians. So we came in and we reduced the roadway from four lanes to two lanes. We closed down the left turn pocket and we created bull bouts with these planter boxes. They're $400 water filled plastic boxes. And they have flowers that grow real nice and they self water with the water inside of it. So there's almost zero maintenance on them. And a car hits one of those, it might bend their bumper, but it's going to save a life. And it allows to narrow up and give a visual friction on the roadway, and it slowed travel speeds from 40 to 45 miles down to 25 to 30 miles an hour. It increased the yield percentage for motorists stopping for pedestrians from 15% up to about 85 to 90%. We also used rectangular rapid flashing beacons. But we realized we also had distracted pedestrians. They had their headphones in and they were reading your medical charts because they were going from one hospital to the other hospital across the street or to the BART station. They had their headphones in, they were reading a book, an iPad, your medical charts or something like that. And they were distracted pedestrians. So what do we do? We didn't force them to push the button. We just put a motion detector up there. And as soon as they walked through that path, the lights all started blinking like it was a cop car. And all the cars came to a complete stop. So we didn't rely on the distracted pedestrian to do the right thing, but we told the motorist, hey, you might have a pedestrian in this corridor to be on the lookout. So we closed down this left turn pocket, we put advanced yield lines, we, we even created a new standard of a crosswalk outside the crosswalk, and we put those little uh, jack-o'-lantern teeth on the outside of the crosswalk. We used the regulatory sign, Yield to pedestrians here, makes it look official. And there's a car stopping at the yield line. And this is the question that I was asking. Why do we build roadways where when a mistake or a poor decision is made, whether it's a drunk driver, a distracted driver, a distracted pedestrian, why does somebody have to die? And right now, 32,000 people are doing that in our communities. Here's a, 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 a roadway in Carlsbad. It's a five lane corridor. My council came to me and said, Brian, we need to fix this. Somehow we need to get that surfer to the big wave safely. Because he's running across the street with a 12 foot board, or that's an eight foot board, a seven foot board. And you see that real narrow bike lane right there, and the 30 miles was just a suggestion. So we've identified five crossing locations up there. And we said, here's what the roadway looks like today. Here's what we'll do. Here's what we did. The before, after, and then we, the before and the visual rendering and the after built up momentum that we could do what we delivered. Now for engineers, this is what it looks like for us on our engineer plans. 
But for an elected official, this is a great way to, to sell them on a concept. Here's a roadway, hotel resort over there, 7-Eleven on the other side of the roadway. The beach down here where I'm at. I'm in the Pacific Ocean. The 7-Eleven has Slurpees. The beach does not allow alcohol. So some people put alcohol in the Slurpee and take it down to the beach. But they gotta cross that street to get to the Slurpee machine and then down to the beach, right? And you gotta go every frequently because your Slurpee goes down. So we put in a crosswalk just like that across the intersection. Because I was sitting out there one night for dinner with my wife and I watched over 100 people that hour cross diagonally around that intersection. I'm like, they're going from the shortest path from curb return to curb return. And if I made them go to the other curb and that curb, they would still cross diagonally through that intersection. People do the shortest path of least resistance, and this is the person using the street now. And the thing I have to say is sometimes we focus on the process rather than the results. And during that process, more people are dying. So there's nothing that kill, low speed kills when it comes to delivering projects to improve safety. And there's a lot we need to be doing in our communities to improve safety. Here's one in front of an elementary school. It looks a lot like this middle school. And, we, and it had a really wide street like this. And really wide streets induce speeding. And the number one complaint I always got when I was a city traffic engineer is speeding on my residential streets. So we took that street in front of that elementary school and we said where that middle arrow is and we said, why don't we do that? Oh my gosh, that looks just like what you guys did out here in front of Reading, right? Or in Sequoia. But then we said, you know, that's not quite enough. We still have some issues out here. And we knew traffic circles at either end of that school we could help parents turn around. It could also help create a gateway feature at this elementary school. So we said, why don't, and we didn't have a lot of money, so we used eight inch ceramic domes for about $4,000 while we were doing a pavement project. We put in this project instead of doing a concrete traffic circle. So now people ride around there. They're just tall enough where it feels awkward to drive over them as a car. The fire trucks can go blowing right over them. A moving truck can go right over them. But now, mothers and fathers dropping off their children can make a U-turn and head back the direction they came from rather than making a three-point turn in front of the elementary school and running over your kid as you're dropping off. This roadway used to not have bike lanes. It was only 24 or 25 feet across. And you start doing the math in your head and you go, what are those travel lanes? Those are nine foot travel lanes right there. And no, they haven't resulted in any killings of any people. Because a semi truck can drive down a nine foot travel lane. So can a bus. Here's this bus passing bicyclists in that bike lane. It can be done. They just do it at a slower speed. We had this curve that looks like an inside outside, inside NASCAR curve. But before the bike lane was there, it was a 20 foot wide travel lane or 25 foot wide travel lane and there's a high school about a quarter mile up the roadway so you can imagine a 16 year old trying to check out their parents new car see how fast they could take this s curve through here and they do the inside outside inside move and so we put in this bike lane to further delineate the travel lane but also we created a bike lane so that students could ride their bikes to campus that mailbox up there right at the curve was getting hit once a month right where the pedestrian is standing right next to that mailbox. But it still wasn't enough. So we came back in and we put in a buffer zone to further delineate, stay on your side of the bike lane. This is a really important message. High speed kills when it comes to cars. So we need to identify ways to design our roadways for a more appropriate speed. And that's not a one size fits all for all communities or all streets. That same roadway where we put the pedestrian crossings in, we narrowed up the lanes to 10 feet, widened the bike lane to eight feet. Oh my goodness, it's not even allowed, but we did it because we're moving 3,000 bicyclists up and down this corridor a day. And we put in a four foot buffer zone. My wife refuses to ride on streets. She will ride on the street because there's enough separation between her and the car. 
Then we get down to this area where there's beach parking and we put the buffer on the other side because the doors are opening and they're pulling coolers and surfboards and wetsuits and they're pulling up their wetsuits and pulling down their wetsuits. Um, they put a towel around. But, uh, um, and then families start using these. And more people start using these. And these aren't lycra-wearing bicycle riders or spandex. These are everyday people that are using Bicycling is their mode of transportation or fitness or recreation, just their part of their daily mobility. Here's a roadway that a thousand feet up it becomes a one-lane roadway. And we said, well, why don't we make it a one-lane roadway right here? And so we started transitioning from a two of two lanes here to one lane. And you can see the, the lane drop. And as you go around the corner, it's still dropping. And then we bring the bike lane out and we allow some parking because there's an athletic field there. When we get up here, the Army-Navy Academy has their academic buildings on one side and their athletic fields on the other, and the cadets have to go back and forth across this roadway. Now they only have to cross two lanes rather than four lanes. We haven't lost a cadet since. And this is what it looks like in the other direction. We also put up speed feedback signs. And some of them even tell you to slow down, knucklehead. You're driving too fast. Here's a great corridor. It's across the Buena Vista Lagoon that's connecting the Oceanside and Carlsbad. The next closest corridor is I-5, which is about three quarters of a mile to the east of here. The ocean is over here. I'm standing in the ocean again. I have a habit of that. This roadway looks like this. There's no bike lanes. There's no sidewalk. How did the two cities connect for people? So we came in and we said to our council, well, I know the general plan says we're supposed to build this as a four-lane roadway, and I know, so we did some preliminary analysis, and to build a four-lane roadway, we'd be taking up more, it's like building a new bridge across the Sacramento River, I'm pretty sure you guys are familiar with all the environmental stuff that had to go into crossing the Sacramento River. The same thing goes with the lagoon, it's very sensitive to the environment. We would have had to raise this roadway up 10 feet, which would have blocked every single home's view of the white water ocean beach. That would take their home from a million dollar home to a half a million dollar home. So we said, what can we do with the roadway as it is today? So we said, hmm, what if we put a sidewalk on one side, take one travel lane away, bike lanes in both directions, and create a trail on the other side? All within the existing edge of pavement to edge of pavement that exists out there today. Just repurposing our roadway that we had. And that's what we built. Now you might say, why are there gaps in there? Well, sometimes the lagoon floods, so the water goes right across the roadway. We shut the roadway down for about 24 hours, or the storm comes. So you've got to let the water drain through there, but if we capture the water, then we've got to treat the water and then put it back in a concentrated system, and that would have been a $3 million solution. And, it just, and the federal and state government said, why don't you just create gaps? And I said, well, what if we created gaps and we just let it free flow across her like it's done for the last 60 years and don't change the pattern of its travel pattern? They're like, sounds like a great solution. So this concrete barrier now becomes for the separation for the trail. So if you don't feel comfortable riding in the bike lanes, you now have separation from the cars. And that's what it looks like up close. And that same area is connected to this intersection, and I call this a hairy intersection because I can't use the D word dangerous. Uh, but it's pretty much an on-ramp for a freeway system. And this is what it looks like. And we said we we're going to do this. And then we came back and we did this. We put a piece of public art as an entryway gate feature into our community, and we connected the two communities. And this is what it looks like. That's what it looks like to an engineer. This is what it looks like to the people that experience it today. And we know roundabouts have a great reduction in re reducing collisions. You can't run a red light through a roundabout, and you're doing it at a slower speed. So even if you do make a mistake, it's usually a fender bender rather than an ambulance. But I say, why do we look at intersections and see what we can do to change them to be more people-oriented? And here's a vehicle-oriented intersection with a traffic signal. And I'm not saying a roundabout is always a people-oriented solution, but it was for this case. Look at the difference between that. Which one do you feel more at home at? And then we said, you know that same quarter we did the pedestrian crossings and we did the narrow travel lanes? What if that roadway evolved even more? What if we said, wow, that Pacific Ocean is an incredible tourist attraction. 
What if we could help connect people to that tourist attraction by doing something like that? And you go back and forth. One you should be drooling about, one you should be terrified of. <laughs> um, okay, so get back to it. But then on that same corridor, they shut it down for a marathon every year, so there's lots of people that love experiencing that peak coast. So it's not like we have to tell people how to use that, right? And when I was in Fresno, we shut down a whole freeway for a bicycle event that brought 47 or 4, 470 different cities and 27 states to Fresno for a three-day physical fitness activity. And 2,000 people got to ride 10 miles of a freeway. It's the first time it's ever been done in the state of California to shut down a freeway for a bicycle event, an organized bicycle event, not a, a protesters event like we've experienced in Oakland. Um, and they've been doing it for four years straight. And then we said, oh, we're encouraging all these people to use bicycles, but we need to provide some bike parking. And so then we also got together with our economic development and did some branding. So we say, I bike Fresno, and the other one says Tower District. And then we became a bicycle-friendly community, which is a great award for your city. And we, one year we installed 30 miles of new bike lanes, and we, the California Classic was the freeway. And we created an I bike Fresno, because sometimes when you build it, they don't come. So we created this I bike Fresno campaign. Last I looked, it has about 5,000 followers on Facebook. It's pretty dynamic when you show your mayor that an I Bike Fresno Facebook page has more likes and fans than hers. <laughs> <laughs> then I went to Carlsbad and I said, hey, it worked in Fresno, let's see if it works down here. And we did a bike to village. We installed them. We had, we had a teenage girl show the teenage boys how to use them. Then the family started using them. Then the toddlers started using them. Then the beach cruisers started using them. Then you used them to get to the breweries. Then we had this picture posted on our city's Facebook page. Mayor, we need more bike racks. You'll see them up in the trees. So we brought a bike corral and put it in the street so we could provide more bike racks. That also happened to be the small business of the year. Then we said, oh, it worked over there, let's try it at this chocolate and yo diggity yogurt shop. So we put in some places in the street maintenance crews did this, and that's what it looked like. And we brought Santa Claus, because he vacations down in Southern California. <laughs> then we found the wine bar, because I like wine, and I said, hmm, look at all those bikes. They're leaning up against the trees and the building. And then you see those little blue dots right on their feet. I, I took a little spray can and went out there and marked it with my little form. The next morning, this is what my crews installed. I'm real proud of them. They responded within 24 hours. And I took a challenge with my mayor and rode my bike around the city for two months straight, parked my truck. And I, this is me dropping off my dry clean. I had to do it a little bit more frequently because I couldn't take the big bag. Uh, um, but you'll notice I have a battery on there. It's called an electric bicycle. I kind of got a big caboose and a big belly. And going up hills, I feel like I'm dragging the titanic anchor behind me. So I needed a little help and a little boost, and it helped me get around, and it also helped me get to work without dripping sweat. So it is, there are options if the desire is to ride your bike, and I also lost 10 pounds in that two-month period. And then a bicycle shop opened that started doing tourism for bikes and renting these things, and they said, Brian, why don't you try out our tandem bike? So I'd ride around. The, the town on my tandem bike picked people up that were walking along. You wait, you want to ride? I need the extra horsepower. Then that bike shop used my bike racks in their logo. Then an event used my bike racks in their logo. And then let's pause. Creating creativity and innovation can occur when we build communities that allow for serendipitous collisions and connections to occur in our communities. And I ask you, where are those serendipitous collisions occurring in your community? Where do you see people connecting with each other? Here's an intersection here. It's an exciting intersection. We moved 8,000 pedestrians through it. So we tried it, and, and they were having a hard time crossing, and so we tried something different. We said, why don't we all just create a pedestrian phase, and we'll let you cross diagonally. We, create, we did a little stripe here. Just in case it didn't work, we could just remove a little bit of striping. And so we tried it, and then we said, oh, it's working, so let's and the traffic commissioner and the court threw out a whole bunch of citations for right turn on red. So we put in the blank LED sign, and we put in the right turn arrow so that if you're turning right on red, it's actually a citation for running a red light. 
And it, and it went from a 15% compliance stopping for pedestrians to about a 95%. And then we did a maintenance program on that roadway and I created a helicopter landing strip. And then I said, well, let's have the people back. And in, a, in two years, we had a 50% increase from 8,000 pedestrians to 12,000 pedestrians using this intersection. That's 4,000 additional customers to the downtown village area. Then a 275,000 private investment to create a, a sign right at that pedestrian scramble was created. People did sign selfies in my pedestrian scramble. People did group selfies. And this is what the Chamber of Commerce said. The sign is in a spot, that's also a place, another word for place, where people will be able to photograph it easily. It has a pedestrian scramble that allows people to walk diagonally through the intersection. This is creating communities through transportation. People and place is important. How do we create that sense of people and place? And here's what I might add. Sometimes we have to think about our businesses and here's a curb cafe. This business wanted to expand in place. They built curb cafes. This is what it looks like from above. This is what it looks like when it was built. This is what it looks like when you're enjoying the first Cadillac margarita served on the... That's me, by the way. This restaurant across the street wanted to do it. The restaurant down the street wanted to do it. Here's some in Long Beach. The businesses were able to expand in place, hire two new employees, and increase their revenues by 50%. So how do we start with the end user's experience? Here's a roadway that used to be a Caltrans highway. It ran through Morgan Hills downtown. The town encouraged their restaurants to do outdoor dining, but then the Downtown Business Association said, you know, our patrons say we can't have a romantic conversation at the outdoor dining because the traffic is so loud and fast, so close to the tables. So we came in and did a demonstration project, and I'll show you that in a little bit. But this is what we're installing February 15th, and we're going to do a six-month pilot program. But to get there, this is before Caltrans took over the roadway, right? And Caltrans built this. And then we did this demonstration, and Morgan Hill has a lot of wineries, so the winery said, well, we have all these extra wineries, barrel, wine barrels, do you want to use them to kind of shut down the roadway and create a people space? So we used those, and we created different ambiances, and what we found is that most people wanted to be able to bike and have access to the downtown, and so the bike lanes were a great thing. This city is also home to specialized bicycles. Headquarters. L.A. is transforming their streets by painting them. Funky colors. This has happened to be the Mountain Dew, yellow and green, that Zachy Mustafa at LADOT is doing. The city of San Diego is doing buffered bike lanes on both sides of the roadway. And I ask you this. Who are you designing your roadway for? The one on the right or the one on your left? Which one exists on your roadways? Do either of them exist on your roadways? Because this is who I design my streets for. This is a mother and her two daughters using my bike corral that I installed. They live about seven blocks away from the Yo Diggity. And two to three times a week they have mother-daughter time where they go have a yogurt together. And this is them becoming customers. And they didn't add any new traffic to the roadways to get to the village. I also design my roadways for you know your roadway is really safe when a pelican feels safe on it. <laughs> so are you a champion to improve your community? And are you tempted by the opportunity to make a difference in your community? Because it will take all of you to come together to improve the community. So I end my questions there. And if you have any thoughts or anything like that, and I'll pull it. Where's the basket? Did the basket make it around? Oh, perfect. Can you bring it up? Do we have any kids here that want to pull out Christmas cards or something like that? So I have.